Uh, well, so now we have uh, the Decidim Stories uh, session, and I give it, and I give the mic to Mauricio Mejia from the OCDE, who will be moderating this uh, session. Thank you, Neil. And bon dia, buenos dias. Nice to see all some familiar but some new faces. Also happy to be back at Decidim. I consider myself as a Decidim ally, maybe not of the community, but here for already some, some conferences. So uh, we're going to talk about something that Neil started to talk about, which is the connection maybe between participatory democracy and climate. And so just briefly, my name is Mauricio Mejia. I'm leading the work on citizen participation at the OECD. Um, we work on both sides, on the non-technology, so citizen assemblies, as you will hear a little bit from our speaker, but also on uh, the technological side, so how to use platforms like Decidim, but others in making sure that citizens have a voice in decision making. And so uh, I think that today's this key, these speakers are a very well placed to speak about this topic because on one side, I think we need more participatory democracy, as Neil was saying, for climate, because climate is a, first of all, long-term issue, and so we, we, th we, we see now that our electoral politics face what some call a myopia, so the difficulty to see and solve long-term issues. So by involving citizens through different means, this is a good way to avoid this myopia and be able to solve long-term issues. But also, I mean, we all know that climate, it's a collective problem, and so for a collective problem, we do need some collective solutions. Uh, and not that, that, that easy to say, but also uh, it's a problem that sometimes or nowadays affects maybe more the people that do not have a seat in the table, that cannot express their needs, and so it's important to have these processes where inclusion and participation is open for everybody, in particular those that are suffering the most on climate change. Uh, and you will hear very different ways to involve citizens. Uh, of course, all of them are connected to Decidim. Uh, that's uh, not a spoiler for you, but uh, maybe just because uh, we sometimes see participatory democracy as one entity or as one block, one way to see it. But participation, it's very diverse. It can take different forms. It can take maybe very slower, maybe more passive ways as just being able to access information, to access data, to be informed. And for climate, that's also very important because we need to be aware, we need to know what governments are doing in, in, in solving the climate uh, emergency. It can take a different form, more on a consultation. I think we're going to hear a little about consultation. And in this, let's say, approach to involving citizens, it's also important to be able to adapt our policies and, and services. But if we go a little bit further and uh, joining what Neil was saying, also the liberation, co-creation, and even going to co-governance aspects of uh, democracy can take us not only on listening and uh, making sure that we attack climate change in a way that solves the problem, but also co-responsabilizing citizens and giving them the, the means to act citizens and, of course, civil society. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start uh, walking you uh, with our very uh, interesting list of speakers. And next to me, I have Stephen Schulz from Director General for Communications of the European Commission. So he's visited us from Brussels. Uh, Stefan is currently managing the citizen engagement platform at the European uh, Commission, where previously he was also involved in the development and the operation of the online platform of the Conference of the Future of Europe, this big transnational participatory process to involve citizens in how to shape the future of the European Union. As you may have guessed, these two projects use Decidim, and uh, Decidim, it's, Decidim is used as a base to offer space for discussion and to involve citizens in different politics, uh, policies across the EU. Before that, Stefan was a spokesperson for uh, the Commission in Germany, in Ireland, and in uh, Germany again, sorry. Yeah. So, <laughs> Stefan, uh, you've been involved in these two big proje projects that use Decidim, projects that involve citizen, citizens across the, the Union. And so maybe from your experience using uh, Decidim to, to involve citizens, what are the key features that digital platforms can uh, bring to make participation more effective, especially in these topics like climate change? Well, I think the, the, there are two uh, key features, I think, which are um, very important. One is to have the, let's say, the, the, the participation 
barrier as low as possible so that as many people as possible can participate, that there's no need, for example, we decided that for the conference and also kept that decision that nobody is needs an, 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 a check, an ID check or whatever to participate because in principle it would be for European citizens only. But we don't care about that. We, uh, it's open for everybody to lower the, the, the entrance uh, threshold. And um, uh, also we have, uh, we have everything in all 24 EU languages which is also very important that everybody can participate in, in uh, his or her uh, own language, uh, mother tongue. Um, and the, another key uh, thing in my view is transparency. So to have everything on the platform, there's nothing beside. Um, everybody can follow the discussion. Everybody has the same knowledge about the discussion. Uh, there, there are no uh, things going on at the sidelines. There's no hidden spaces where things are uh, just for certain people. So we, for example, we decided that um, governments, particip participants, speaking, participating on behalf of a, an EU government have the same rights as every citizen, any other uh, uh, participant, no special uh, treatment, uh, everything is on the same level um, and everything is transparent so that, not on, that somebody does not have an automatically a better, a higher weight in the discussion just because he or she speaks on behalf of a government, for example. I think this is very important for the users, for the citizens, that they see everybody on the, on the debate, on the platform is equal and can evenly participate in the discussion. Thank, thank you, and I, I think it's what you say, it's very important, the, the, the positive aspects of bringing digital to, to participation, and that uh, connects me to our next speaker, uh, Carla Beinvinda. Carla is Director of Digital Participation and Network Communication at the General Secretariat of the Presidency in Brazil, where she oversees Brazil Participa Participativo, que it's a platform that uses Decidim uh, to involve citizens in uh, policy making. And since 2011, she's been a member of the Brazilian Federal Civil Service as a specialist in public policy and government management, where she has worked across government agencies. <clears throat> Beyond her uh, civil servant career, Carla has also worked as a practitioner, as a scholar, uh, focusing, of course, on the relation between civil society, the state, and participatory policies. Carla serves also on the board of People Powered, a nonprofit organization that promotes participation across the globe, and she holds a PhD in political sciences from the University of Sao Paulo. Carla, uh, we've heard a lot about Brazil uh, implementing Decidim, uh, even previous year we started talking about Brazil becoming the biggest uh, user of Decidim, but now you recently involved also citizens in the consultation of Brazil's climate plan. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and also if you are Brazil considering other forms of participation. So this is for your slides, which so will be shown here. So I, I will speak standing because I, I find it easier. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Very nice to be here. Very nice to be uh, with again at the Cidin Fest. That's, this is my second year here. And to, can, uh, to talk about uh, climate change and participation, I would say that first in Brazil, I would say that from two years ago, this was not a, a topic, a real topic in politics, in day-to-day -day politics. Differently from Europe, where people have been discussing climate change for a while, this was seen as a far away thing. And this year, we've experienced several cli extreme climate events. This is Porto Alegre, the city where participatory budgeting was born. And this year, we had a major flooding, and the whole state actually was affected. We also had uh, this year, it's not going. Can, can you go next? Because uh, it's not, well, okay. The, this year, this is the Amazon, and this is like a major river that was never dried, and we had the, one of the major dry, drought of the history of, of the Amazon forest, which also um, 
I really cannot, can you go next? <laughs> Which also uh, made that we had a lot of massive fire, wildfires all over the country, leaving, uh, leading for bad, bad air quality in several, several cities. For example, I couldn't sleep in my apartment for two weeks because of the effect of, of the smoke. So this is now, uh, unfortunately, due to a, a terrible situations, climate crisis is in the media, is, is in the topics in Brazil, and we've, uh, and people are asking for solutions, for quickly solutions for that, and we know there are no quickly solutions. So one thing is, uh, Brazil has started to make its uh, climate action plan in January, and in June, we launched a participatory uh, process for building this action plan that will last. We are still struggling to know if it's going to last six months or a year long, but it has several different phases. So this was the launching of what we call Plano Clima Participativo in Portuguese, climate, climate plan, participatory climate plan in English. Next. I, 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 it doesn't work. So it's organized in different phases. We thought about having, so we're talking about federal uh, levels. This is much harder to build actual participation from the citizens than when you're in the local government. So we have to think of different phases and different ways of reaching people. One of them, the first one was, well, let's just listen and gather all the proposals and all the things that people have to say to us uh, in a way that you don't have to be an expert. To act, to, you don't have to know what the difference of mitigation and adaptation is to actually make a proposal and, and arrive. So the, what we, we did is the, the Climate Action Plan has 18 different axes, uh, and each one, some in mitigation, some in adaptation, we said, let's not divide it, let's make it just, just send the, the, the proposals. And then what we had, we just finished this first phase. Now it's being analyzed by the different ministries to know if they are technically possible, if they are related to the federal government or to local governments, or it's an international issue. So there's a lot of technicalities in, into this. Uh, and then we are going to, to, to give a feedback for people and in, to say what can be incorporated in the final plan. At the same time, you know, we have just launched yesterday, <laughs> the second phase, which is a, a public consultation on what is the national strategy, um, climate, so what well, it's called national strategy on adaptation. It's going to be presented at COP29, uh, and we are listening, we are, uh, receiving then contributions on the full text. So we know that this second phase is slightly more specialized. It's hard for people, for someone who is not directly involved in, into the issue to, to actually be able to contribute in an already detailed plan. So that's why we wanted to have like this first open phase. And then uh, in the end, we are going to offer the feedback on the full proposals on the text and we are planning on next year to do uh, public consultations on each one of the sectoral plans. So there are 18 sectoral plans. They are very uh, complex, and we are we're planning on how to do public consultations on all of them at the same time as we hold uh, in-person gatherings, discussions, and other types of meetings with civil society. Can you next, please, because it's not working. So, uh, okay, no, it's working. So back one. One back, okay. So this is just, if you, if you go into the CD, uh, this was the first phase. That's what how we asked, we made just a, a general question, how can Brazil tackle climate change and reduce it, its impacts? And these are the four most voted uh, proposals, just to give you a, a glimpse of, of how it worked. Next, please. So, so far we've had uh, like around more than 200,000 people access in the platform. Um, it, it has been slightly different from if you, if you, if you saw the pluriannual plan next year, last year. Uh, we had much more access by computer, which what, what it, it tells us that there is, it's a less popular participation. So it says to us that there are more highly specialized people participating because they spend more time in the computer. 
and w when we flew the annual plan, we had 90% of access through mobile, which means that we had uh, mostly people accessing in, like, in their cell phones, which is the most used way in Brazil. We had, for, uh, so you, you can see the numbers, it's in, some parts are in Portuguese, I'm sorry, but I, I couldn't ha translate everything. So we had more than 2,000 comments, 1.2, thousand proposals uh, and 47,000 votes uh, in all the in this in around two months next please so from this 1,000 proposals the 10 most voted proposals from each of the, one of the 18 access is going to be analyzed and considered we also held a similar uh, we tried to, to do something similar to what we did to the pluriannual plan was to have in-person gatherings in each state but this year we had local elections so it turned to be much more complicated to do this during the electoral period so we decided to have to hold just uh, one meeting in each region so this is around the the gatherings that we had they were kind of trying to to be related to the the typical uh, biome of the region, so in the Amazon, uh, in Cerrado, which is where I am from, in the Pampas, so it's different regions and different uh, kind of ecosystems that we have in Brazil. And we had around 4,000 people participating in person. Next, please. Uh, and so this is, these are the most voted uh, proposals. The idea, I think, the, the most voted one was to have uh, a national, uh, it, it's a general, so it's a general one because it's a, it's a national climate emergency policy. So now one thing that the previous uh, government was a uh, climate negationist. It, 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 didn't, it didn't believe that there was climate change going on. And it, uh, all, all the disaster and Disaster policies were dismantled, so we are we this year were very very poorly uh, or organized to actually handle all the disasters that we had, and I think this is it. It tells us a little bit of what we are worried about. Next, please. So this is this is just to say that most of the proposals also were like concentrated into specific axes like biodiversity. Uh, restoration and uh, forest protection. Next, please. And so this is just uh, how it, it was, it worked also very different from the pluriannual plan last year that we had like a major access just in the end. This year we have been having like highlights all the time that we, di we, we would handle like an in-person um, mobilization process. So this is just to give you a glimpse, and now uh, I think we have more to, to talk about in the, the next ones, in the next questions. Thank you, Carla. And I don't know if you realize, but we'll be moving gradually from fully online to now a little bit more in person to get to Pablo uh, for a, a more rather than more in person with a little bit of online, but uh, uh, for a, a change into a new way of involving citizens, which it was also mentioned by uh, by by director of, of participation and open government in Catalonia, but the use of citizen assemblies and just to give to maybe contextualize, just to make sure that you don't think this is only happening in Catalonia, but uh, for example, from the 800 cases that we have gathered at the OECD in terms of using citizen assemblies for climate, 17% are about climate change and environment is today the most used topic for citizen assemblies across uh, the OECD. So I'm happy to have uh, Pablo here to talk about this, but before, Pablo is responsible for strategic projects of Directorate of Citizen Participation at the Generalitat de Catalunya. He has a degree in sociology, a master in public management, and postgraduate in urban environmental policies. And during the last seven years, Pablo has promoted deliberative and participatory projects in the public sector, being technical coordinator of the Catalan Citizens Assembly for Climate Change, and previously worked in academia, public governance field, as well as national and international public policy. So Pablo, can you talk us a little bit about this Catalan Citizen Assembly uh, and how do you think or how have you been using digital tools to enrich this process? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mauricio. First of all, thank you very much for having me here and the opportunity to share with you our experience. Um, this project was very ambitious for us, uh, so I work within the Citizen Participation Unit of the Government of Catalonia, which has extensive experience in citizen participation projects. 
However, this was our first experience running a citizens' assembly, which posed us many challenges, and, but also led us, uh, to, to, lead us to, to reflections on how to improve our work. So I don't know if I can share our uh, presentation. It's not working <laughs> super good. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I want to share a first uh, uh, a video with you to give you an overview image of our project. And then I will highlight um, some of the key features and key learnings of, of this project. But before, uh, I, I like to, to start the conversation about climate, uh, climate or citizen uh, citizens' assemblies, uh, mini publics, deliberative projects with a question to talk about this, this field. And it's, do we, do we trust that um, a white or a diverse representation of regular citizens could uh, elaborate valuable recommendations for policy making if they are given with proper time, resources, and knowledge? Because this kind of project, citizen assemblies or mini publics, rely on this idea. And this is what, uh, what we, we wanted to, to do. So maybe we can share now the, the video and then we will keep talking about it. Sound is not working. Um, yeah, it's muted. Well, if it's not possible, then because we have limited time, right? So. Do you think, Mauricio? Maybe we. I mean, maybe we can continue, and if they solve the technical issue, we yeah, can come back sure. to Yeah, sure. So, to talk a little bit more about our citizen assembly, some key features. This was our first citizen assembly, as I mentioned, and it was for the first experience for the for the whole Catalonia territory, right? Because the municipality of Barcelona already. Uh, run an assembly, but this was for the 8 million people of Catalonia. Okay, so for this project there were two ministries involved, the one with competences on citizen participation and the one with competences on uh, climate change. All established by a government agreement which made accountable the government for the recommendations elaborated by the citizens. For this project we selected 100 people uh, by with Civi with a civic lottery process, therefore with equal opportunities for any citizens to be selected and participate uh, in this project, right? We run the civic lottery with seven uh, criteria, seven socio-demographic criteria, and we were happy because we all targets were reached. So we had this diverse uh, representation of different profiles of uh, Catalan citizens. They got a mandate to make recommendations on two specific policies. First one was uh, what kind of criteria should we apply when, uh, for the deployment of energy infrastructures in the territory? And the other one was what kind of agri-food model should we have in Catalonia? Uh, for some of you, if you're not from Catalonia, this is a very important economic sector and it, invo it involves the pork industry. So this was, this, this was, these two were considered like two very important topics. Um, for, for this mandate, uh, they had the help of different experts, speakers, and a team of facilitators, and they met during six weekends between October 2023, uh, 2022 and uh, February 2023. Um, we use also the but to be honest, uh, as Mauricio mentioned, we are the less digital uh, project here, so I hope uh, it won't disappoint you. Uh, but we use the CD, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, and to, to foster or to, to, make more easy, to make easier for participants to, to take part in this project, we, uh, we give them with some services. We offer some services uh, for inclusivity, uh, like accommodation, transportation, uh, 
catering, uh, childcare services, and we compensated their participation with 65 euro per each session because they were working six weekends, right? So it's quite a work and they got a mandate, so we are asking for their help and that was important. And we were trying to reach uh, all type of profiles in Catalonia, not the typical ones that always uh, participate in, in these projects, right? right? So this was also something important for us. Um, and after all this work, uh, we, we were able to, 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 to have 48 recommendations, citizen recommendations for these two topics. But this more or less is what you can find in many other citizens' assemblies. Uh, I want to highlight that we had uh, a willingness to innovate. We were able to read all the OCD uh, documents, we were able to see what happened in the French Convention or the Citizen Assembly in Spain. And all, of the, the, all these assemblies were running assemblies about climate change in general. And let's be honest, a single Citizen Assembly is not going to solve climate change. It's not possible to work on all the complex matters related to climate change during six weekends. And that's like a huge task, task for citizens. We didn't want to have a long list of general recommendations. So we tried to, to establish very specific topics. Actually, we wanted just one topic. It was finally two topics, but we wanted to be more specific. And the other important thing we wanted to do is to, to have an approach not like an open question, what we should do about climate change to reach uh, emissions goals. We wanted, our approach was more about political dilemmas. And that's where we think that we could make more a difference because experts already know what should be done. If you, th if you ask what should, be, what should we do to, to cut emissions, experts know that already. The, the, our approach was more, okay, sometimes this is not that easy. So we posed a challenge, a difficult question to solve to citizens, like, okay, we know that energy infrastructures are good to cut emissions, but this has some other impacts on the territory for municipalities or for the landscape or for some other economic uh, sectors. So to what extent, what criteria, to what extent are we willing to do something? These kind of questions where you have to assess the trade-offs. That means the advantages, but also the advantages. And one considering all these questions is, is where we think that citizens can uh, make a stance and say, okay, we are going to do this or to, what is, or to this extent, right? For example, with tourism in Barcelona, this is like a huge question now. Okay, it's a very important economic sector, but at the same time, it has uh, many other impacts. So, okay, that's not easy. What we should do? That's, that's the kind of questions we, we were trying to, to ask citizens. And actually, this is also the, the aim of our European project, where we take part at uh, Horizon Project. Uh, where we are trying to, uh, to develop some innovative tools like, like this one, right? So this was our, our approach. And some final reflections uh, about the, some learnings and challenges we, we found here. First one is about the organization. Uh, in this European project, we're trying to, to develop some new methodologies. That's nice, that's great. But actually, the main problem we have many times is uh, within our organization, uh, public administrations struggle with citizen participation logics. So we had to find ways or to think how we should pay participants. Public, the, the administration is not prepared to say, okay, I'm going to pay our regular citizens for participating in this project. Or how we're going to get access to uh, population data, uh, statistics. Many things that has forced us to look for some other ways, but at the same time, it gives us the opportunity to look for better infrastructures for citizen participation within the organization. And this is even more important for us than the methodology many times. Uh, or for example, uh, if we talk about the CDIM, it would be great if with the CDIM we could co conduct the civic lottery. Actually, with the CDIM, we, we, uh, people trying to, to participate, we sent 20,000 invitations to the whole uh, to the, all the territory. Among those who wanted to participate, they could apply through the CDIM. But it could be great if we could also uh, run the strat stratify lottery with the CDIM, for example. So that kind of things, right? But also, uh, this project has been very useful for us to 
be better prepared for a next one. So we've learned a lot uh, about citizens' assemblies, and we think that we could do, uh, of course, a better one next time. It's a very difficult project, I would say, or a very uh, stressful uh, project, uh, so we need to make it easier. And we've learned a lot. For example, uh, with this approach of political dilemmas I mentioned, um, we've experienced that citizens tend to avoid controversial issues. It, that's very interesting because if you go to the parliament, you see many times politicians fighting so, so hard, right? But citizens tended to avoid controversial issues. They wanted to go for the easier uh, solutions, but also the less impactful solutions. So we needed to, uh, to keep these uh, political dilemmas and trade-offs approach constantly through the uh, whole process. And finally, one, the last uh, key learning we've obtained, of the, yeah, the last important thing is that, that with this project, uh, we think that many of the innovations we have applied uh, can be useful for regular uh, participatory projects. For example, childcare services. We weren't using childcare services for other participatory projects, and we are thinking now of using, maybe not always, but for many other projects, childcare services or the use of uh, population data to, to have better access to, to, to people, to, to inform them about the project, these kind of things, because with the project we also establish new relationships, for example, with the uh, Catalan Institute for Statistics. So, as you can see, uh, it has been a very ambitious project, and it has provided also with a lot of learnings and things to, to reflect on. And maybe we can keep afterwards with the conversation. Thank you, Pablo. And I, I think you gave a, a, an interesting task for the decision community to integrate sortition mm -hmm. into, into the software. Uh, before we move to, to the questions, I have some, but of course, if you can start preparing some follow-up questions, but uh, I, I just wanted to give the floor back to, to Stefan. Uh, and I, I don't know if we can put the first lights on the screen, please. Uh, Yes, Stefan, sorry, I caught you before, but uh, I think it's, it's good to get us back into the real DCDIM, use of DCDIM at the, at the European Union. So if you can maybe walk us through once you see your slides on the screen. Uh, I think, uh, yes, yes. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, I will also uh, stand up also because I can <laughs> see then the, the better the screen. So. Um, uh, what we do at the European Commission is, um, since uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe, I mentioned that already in the beginning, um, there was a, the, this conference was a project, a one-year project, went from 2021 to 2022, and um, one of the outcomes of this uh, uh, project was the demand by the citizens, by the participants, to have a permanent tool on the European level where people can discuss uh, uh, EU issues, um, can uh, um, make proposals, um, can uh, uh, participate in, in, in the, the, the policy making process on EU level. And um, based on this uh, demand by the citizens, uh, the Commission decided to have a um, a permanent uh, tool, a permanent platform where we can, on the one hand, on the Commission side, we can launch debates, and on the other hand, people can participate. Um, I don't know if you can click to the next. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, we have launched this new citizens engagement platform just this year in February. Ah, so it's I very new. And um, uh, we, uh, this platform is based on the, uh, at least the participatory part is based on, on Decidim. Um, it was decided because we wanted to have something that is uh, also capable of doing uh, uh, communication, information, uh, showing a lot of uh, other things, informing citizens. We decided to split the platform into two parts. One part is a standard commission website system uh, based on Drupal, you might know that, and the other part where the people can participate uh, is based on Decidim. Um, can you switch to the next? Um, sorry. Um, so um, 
what we have launched is the, this, this platform in February with our first debate, which was energy efficiency. And um, as Pablo just said, we, uh, it, it's difficult to have a very broad topic for a discussion. So we started with a very, let's say, small portion of the whole and fighting uh, uh, climate change issue, uh, which is energy efficiency. So basically what we all can do uh, to lower our energy use, uh, because obviously energy that does, is not needed is the best for the climate. Um, we launched this uh, uh, debate, and as I said in the beginning, it is very important in our view to have things transparent. So we have on the platform, everybody, every participant can see the different phases, what happens uh, if people participate, if they make a contribution. Uh, maybe I have to say that we, on the, on the commission side, we have changed the um, uh, the different names for the different parts of the DCDIM platform. Uh, so we do not speak about processes. We not, do not speak, I think, about proposals. We, uh, uh, in, in this case, we are speaking about uh, contributions. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, but uh, it was decided to, to change those uh, uh, names. Um, but the functionality behind, obviously, is the same. Um, so everybody who participates can see uh, how, it, how it goes, what is the next step, what happens if I make a contribution, if I participate. Um, and uh, one next step is that we have for the topics, if you, if you are, uh, if you see, we have here the energy efficiency is one of the topics. We will always have a citizens panel accompanying or following a uh, debate on the platform. This is basically an assembly. Uh, we had that also in the conference on the future of Europe, where we have 150 uh, randomly selected citizens from across Europe. It sounds very easy here, but it is very difficult to achieve, I have to say, um, because randomly means really randomly. Computer-generated phone numbers, people are called, have to be convinced that this is not a scam, um, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, they also have to match certain criteria because we wanted to have the 150 in the group, in the room in Brussels, should more or less represent the 450 million European citizens. So 50% women, 50% men, 30%, I think, or 25% people under 25, starting with 16. Um, and um, this is always a challenge to, to reach those numbers. But we managed, and we had those different um, um, uh, panels, whereas the first three were without running the, the platform. So the first one where we have both parts, both tiers, debate on the platform where everybody can participate, and then the panel with 150 citizens was energy efficiency. And the second one this year was tackling hatred in society. Um, I said already, we can, I, I, I can uh, uh, skip that, um, that we had uh, 150 citizens meeting three weekends. Um, and in the end, we have um, 13, in this case, we had 13 recommendations made by the citizens directed to the res responsible uh, uh, director general from the European Commission uh, what the Commission should consider in the planning and policy making what the, the citizens think should be done on EU level. Um, sorry, no. Um, for this panel, for the first time, we had the, 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 um, uh, the point where the, the outcome or the kind of a analysis made on the basis of the participants on the platform. So we had this running for roughly three weeks. You can see the, the dates um, before the panel worked on it. Um, and uh, those 50 contributions and the comments and the endorsements were analyzed and fed into the discussions in the citizens panel. So uh, the, the 
the wider community, the, in theory, all EU citizens, could directly, by contributing on the platform, influence the discussions in the panel with the 150 citizens meeting um, in Brussels. As you can see, um, I have here just uh, the, the major uh, point of discussion that then uh, was used as a starting point for the, for the panels. Obviously, awareness, people need to know that energy efficiency is important, um, that how they can really lower their energy use, etc. So the, the, the different discussions on the platform were clustered in topics, and those topics then were fed into the, um, in the panel discussions where we had working groups according to the different um, um, uh, subtopics, let's say. Um, if you want, you can, um, you can obviously, everybody can participate. Uh, you can follow the discussions. Um, this is, I have to say, one of our major, um, let's say, points where we have to work on is making the platform visible, making, making the platform known, and uh, higher, obviously, higher the participation rate. And I said this in, in the beginning, we are we always keen to lower the, the threshold, the barrier, for people to uh, participate, to make the step to register. What we have to have, this is something I, we unfortunately cannot get rid of, is people are obliged to uh, uh, register on the platform. This is, and for that you only need an email address, as I said in the beginning. But still, this is an obstacle for some. I'm happy to discuss if you have any views on that and if, uh, any tips. I'm really happy to, to, to hear your, maybe your different uh, approaches to this. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I also <laughs> see some people in the room almost jumping into the stage to ask them. Uh, so I don't know if maybe we can take one round of questions from the floor, and then we can uh, build on that. I see Ali, that was the person she was about to jump to the stage, and then maybe Eloise, if we can take these two. Uh, you decide if you have something to say, want to compliment, and then we can continue uh, having a conversation. Uh, thank you so much for all your talks, and, and it was really interesting to, because uh, we see those case studies online, seeing through communications and stuff, but it's good to finally have, you know, you talking about it as well. Uh, my question is for Stefan. Um, how do you today set the topic of a citizens panel, and if it's not happening already, do you think in the near future citizens could be involved in setting the agenda of the citizens panels and debates online? Um, at the moment, we are simply, um, well, simply, it's not a simple process, but um, we are looking at the work program of the Commission. We are looking at the different uh, director generals. The Commission is divided in direct, director generals like uh, ministries. And we look at what is there in the work plans, um, what is in the pipeline. Um, and then we, we, we discuss, obviously, with the, with the experts, would it be possible to have this topic on the platform and as a panel. Um, one criteria obviously is that it has to be something that has, can have an impact in the policy making process. Because our promise is that this is not just hot air. If there is an outcome, if there are recommendations by the citizens, it has to somehow, uh, uh, um, and it has to have an impact in the policy making process. It has to be acknowledged and, and uh, taken care of in the process. So we, if we would start something out of the blue because we think it's a nice topic, um, this is not really, uh, 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 would probably not be helpful because we would not be able to tell the, the participants on the platform, in the panel, that their work has really an, an, an impact. Um, however, we have discussed and we, I, ho I'm, I'm, I hope and I'm pretty confident we will have in the, in the future, um, a debate, let's say an open debate. We had that during the conference, one uh, uh, open debate about topics, what citizens would like to have 
as discussion on the platform and also would like to have as discussion in the, in the panel. Um, and then let's see how that, how that um, uh, goes. We had that, as I said, in the conference, which was quite interesting. However, I also have to say that we always have then the obstacle that the EU is not responsible for anything and has not the competence for anything. We never made, we never said on the platform or in the panel or so, don't discuss this because we cannot do anything, it's not a European uh, competence. We always said, discuss whatever you want and we will have to see how this fits into the system um, in order not to uh, let's say, kill the discussion before it really uh, starts. Yeah, hopefully this was <laughs> quite a long answer, but uh, sufficient. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, for, uh, I, I am really glad that you understood that the CDM is just a tool, but uh, making a participatory uh, program means something wider, right? Like reaching to the final citizens and specifically in climate, uh, climate change, it means that you need to do political pedagogy, right? Uh, so you need to teach regular citizens how to make very technical decisions. So I would like to ask you, like, how was this process of just teaching regular people uh, to get them up to speed so that they could take those very technical decisions. Also, if you have any stories to share, like maybe for some of them it was the first time they were asked about these very technical topics. Um, and the second question is for Carla. Uh, I think the Brazilian government in both the, like the multi-year plan and this plan, uh, you were very brave in using the proposals uh, feature because uh, in my experience, like politicians are kind of skeptical of using that feature because it means they are delegating too much control, right? People could put illegal or offensive or maybe not illegal but controversial or uncomfortable proposal. So I would like to know uh, how was the internal conversation to convince, uh, you know, the team to use that specific uh, component and also how did you manage uh, the component so that it didn't get out of control? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think the, the choice to use the open component is related to the idea that uh, it's where you can get uh, a less um, technical participation. You have less barriers to actually go there and just just say what you're thinking about. Uh, but it, the concerns were mo much more about not losing the control on the proposals because we believe that the voting does it. So like the mobilization and the voting and you're going to get, uh, like there, there are sometimes weird proposals, but, but they usually don't get much voting. So they just lower the barrier. And the, the, net, the, net, the, pros, the democratic process is solves it. But our concerns were much more regarding um, hackers or like um, hate speech or there was this huge concern in last year during the multi-year plan but i believe that when we we talked about this last year we used the, a digital a unique digital identity that you, is used all over the federal government to access uh, more than 5000 public services already so each uh, Brazilian has its tax number I identity that can use to join. So w when the person is identified personally, it will it's much less likely that we will make uh, some pro some kind of proposal that is offensive or criminal in a way. Um, so w and we also had human moderation, but that was very little uh, used actually. We, the, mo the the biggest problem that we had in the climate change uh, plan was uh, marketing. We had a lot of people uh, doing like kind of greenwashing marketing <laughs> of like in some initiatives and we had to moderate it. This was like the main issue. There, there were actually lots of people trying to sell services or in a way. This was actually, the, it was kind of unexpected for us uh, and this was the main issue. And what we had like in the main, in the most voted proposals in terms of like more relevant uh, political issues was that uh, usually uh, professional categories are much more able to mobilize and 
as the digital unique identity is very much used by civil servants for a lot of things, they they kind of they are they e more easily enter the platform, and so many civil servants professionals have done like mobilizations and asked for like uh, higher salaries or stuff like that, both in the multi-year plan and also here. So here uh, at the, the climate action plan, there was a mobilization for the people who are. Um, who work in the forests for uh, combating fire. So they were kind of requesting, so you're discussing climate action plan, please, uh, you, you, we, we have to have better work conditions. So in a way it's connected, so it's not a problem, but they, they, they are unproportionately more represented in the platform. So I would say that this was uh, some kind of issue, but like the, the natural process uh, of voting and uh, hierarchy and then doing the technical analysis kind of solves everything. And we didn't have major uh, problems of, for example, some people s making a big proposal that saying that climate change doesn't exist and this is the most voter. We didn't have any kind of issue in this regard, in, like in, in the more political level that we would be concerned about. Yeah, um, you mentioned this thing about how to make more comprehensive technical information and how we make citizens uh, elaborate technical solutions. First of all, I would say that in our case, uh, we don't want citizens to elaborate technical solutions. We wanted them to elaborate political recommendations based on the knowledge about technical solutions, proposals, and uh, knowledge, right? With working with experts, for example. But we had experts with different points of view opposite points of view, and they had to assess what they were saying, right? But this is a very, very uh, challenging thing for us also, and we are thinking how to improve because we think there are a lot of uh, room for improvement here. Uh, what we did was uh, we started working uh, with a content group uh, composed with experts with different points of view about the matter, uh, in-house experts, uh, to elaborate what we call a deliberative curriculum, meaning uh, what citizens should know or what citizens should think about in order to uh, give an answer to the mandate, to the dilemma we are posing, right? So that we define three blocks of content. First one about general climate change, basic information or more objective information. Then an, another block of content, which was uh, what the government is able to do and what it's not able to do, or what it's willing to do and what it's not willing to do. Because you, you, you need to have this information. You can make a recommendation, and maybe the government has not the competency. And third one was probably the most important, was what are the experts saying about this? What are the different points of view? And what are the, the reasons they argue for their solutions, so that citizens can assess and make a political recommendation, but not a technical, because the technical experts know better. Uh, that was the idea, but it was challenging. And once we go through the learning phase of the assembly, uh, it's also difficult to, to what you said. Uh, it's complex information. It's uh, vast amounts of information. And how you uh, translate this to a very diverse uh, to very diverse profiles, low educated, high educated, uh, with different backgrounds from different regions. This is a challenge for us, and we need to, to think about it. What we know is that master classes don't work, and we tend to think, okay, you offer information, and people is going to learn. Uh, probably it doesn't work that way. Uh, for example, where we organize debates uh, between experts, it worked very well. Uh, citizens were very attentive to, to, to experts. But kind of master classes, one after the other. Uh, didn't work that, that well, but as, as I said, it's something, uh, and I think uh, I was in a workshop uh, last week about this matter, and I think everyone is thinking how to, to improve this, because it's super important, yeah. Do you want to compliment? Well, I can only uh, agree that we are facing the same, the same issue that uh, uh, you just described, and we also do not want to have people discussing technical issues, and nevertheless, we also have experts in the room, in, in the panels, who are explaining certain um, uh, uh, things and also have different views on, on, the, on the matter. 
um, to give the, uh, the, the, the citizens who are by definition not experts and have no idea, no, no knowledge or not just this, the, the ordinary knowledge about a certain topic, get more information to have a better view and to have a better, let's say, ground for making decisions and for, for making recommendations. Maybe we can take a last round. I just wanted to have a follow-up question because um, I think in digital participation is very important to be inclusive and to make sure that it's not only the people that have already access and already power to participate, but I think that even more in the question of climate change because the people that suffer or will suffer the most are sometimes unrepresented. Uh, minorities, migrants, uh, indigenous communities, uh, and also the future generations which are sometimes absent in this table. So I just wanted to quickly ask if you have any specific actions that you took to make sure that the use of digital platforms were not excluding uh, these maybe more uh, usually excluded groups. And I can already start seeing the hand, so I can share mm -hmm. the microphone there. Okay. But do we take more than one question at a time? We can, yeah, maybe. So I saw that there were one there. There, there. So there we have three at least. Should I start? Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Anna. Uh, I was actually part of the evaluation team uh, of the Conference for the Future of Europe. And really good to see that uh, the work is continuing. So my question is in relation to, to the uptake, um, and especially for the Catalan Assembly. The recommendations that resulted, um, to what extent are they informing now policies? I know it's the, always the difficult question, but it's, it's the important no, no. one too. Thank you. I think I gave you an answer. I don't know if that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's also something that we are all thinking how we could uh, reinforce the, the final impact of the recommendations. Of course, you know that we have uh, gone through a change in government and it has happened to some other governments also in Spain and that means uh, some ascertainments about the, the, the recommendations. Um, what we've done, it's, uh, we've already uh, done a technical evaluation of the citizens' recommendations so that when the new government came, they already could have the technical assessment of the citizens' recommendations saying, okay, this is uh, um, feasible and this is maybe not so much. So th th this, th there are all the information. And now it's expected to have the political uh, final say on the recommendations. Uh, for the first quarter of the next year. Uh, so we are happy with that. Uh, we'll see the final results. And we've also designed like a follow-up model to, to, to keep uh, explaining to citizens and participants how it's been implemented. That's, that's the idea. And we'll see next year what the political uh, say is. But we are also thinking how we could reinforce the accountability, the political accountability for the recommendations. Something that I think we are all also debating uh, about it because it's a weakness of, the, of this kind of project for sure. So we'll take two more. I, th I think there was one behind and one here and then I'll, I'll give you the floor to answer these three. Uh, thank you so much again for sharing your experiences. My name is Carla Van Ort. I represent EuroCities. Uh, I just had a question following what you mentioned, Mauricio, about this representation, and I think it's for Pablo, because you mentioned at some point uh, it was difficult to have the people or the citizens talking about uh, the, the crucial or the most uh, yeah. critical topics, let's say. Yeah. But I wanted to invert the question. I don't know if you work also, of course, with a, a, a wide range of citizens, but also with collectives or groups working uh, on this topic. So how was that inclusion or the representation within that big wide range of citizens that you had? Or, and if there is any other channel that you hold besides the assembly or it was also included in the assembly as well? So how we were able to, to we have a wide... Make, uh, we're uh, just we making some, some questions and so everyone... Oh, sorry. Answers. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. My name is Isabel. I do a lot of work with participatory budgeting, and one of the things that is always a challenge is the timeline. I heard that you met over six weekends in Pablo's case. I heard three, and then for Brazil, I heard that some of the aspects of the timeline were still being decided. I was wondering if you had any reflections on whether or not that was enough time, 
and if it wasn't um, the role that maybe the platform could have had and some of the follow-up with the discussions. Thank you. So I think I don't see more. So uh, very cautious of time. So if we, if we can maybe use this also as your own wrap-ups using these answers, and then we'll just close it from there. So maybe I'll start here, and then we we'll go on to Pablo. Yeah, maybe I start with this uh, with the last uh, uh, question. Yeah, I mean, in a, in an ideal world, the the panels would probably last for I don't know ten weekends or so um, to discuss everything. Um, also, the citizens um, need a certain time to to adapt and to 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 uh, adapt to the environment, to the discussions. There are p participants who never left their country, uh, who are now all of a sudden in Brussels and uh, uh, have to discuss things with uh, uh, with uh, uh, interpretation all the time. Everybody can speak in his own language, and so we have always interpretation in all languages. Um, we have uh, discussed the issue, um, and to be quite frankly, it is all a question about money on the one hand, and the second, uh, the people have to have the time. Um, so it is, if you would, you need a certain, you need a weekend, you need a certain gap between the weekends, people have to have the time to come to Brussels. We have decided that one weekend in the middle is online, we, we will reconsider this maybe, uh, to, 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 um, to give the people the chance not to travel three times. For some it is really an issue uh, because it's sometimes really difficult to, to come from all corners of Europe to, to Brussels. Um, also because of the, uh, the, the inclusion, the accessibility for everybody, we did not limit things to, to there was people coming in the wheelchair and other things. So all this has to be done. Um, and uh, therefore we th thought it is okay with, with, by having three weekends. In, in the conference we had four weekends, um, so one more. However, it was during the still uh, COVID times, so more, there was more online than in, in, um, in, 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 in meetings uh, in person. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's a, a constant discussion and adjustment. Well, uh, so regarding the, the matter of time, uh, in participatory budgeting, you have to follow up for the budget year uh, in a citizens' assembly, you do have a methodology, usually that uh, the, the people have to understand the problem, then discuss for a certain time. In our case, we are, we are building some kind of, like the idea of participatory plans for federal programs is something new, that we don't have a pre-established methodology. And also, in the building of the climate action plan, we don't have a strict schedule of the plan, so that's why we cannot, in advance, define if how long it's going to last, because the schedule has been changing as we have been doing. But we, what we always try to alert is we need uh, some significant time, at least like a month or pref preferably more time for citizens to know that the process is online, to get to know uh, what they can propose and how the platform works, the, uh, solving the issue of actually logging in, which is the biggest barrier usually. So we know that time is an important uh, issue and we are trying to address in the best way, but we don't, do not have a full, uh, a complete methodology and we're do, uh, doing and learning and trying to improve gradually. We do, we do have lots of ideas on how to improve the next processes and we know that there are some things that didn't work quite well that we, we want to do it better next time. And uh, in matters, in one of the things that we want to do better is the matter of inclusion that uh, Mauricio addressed. So when we started uh, building the sitting, one of the first things that we did was to, uh, so the sitting was mostly developed for desktop. And in Brazil, 62% of people use internet exclusively through a mobile phone. And we said, we have to do it mobile first if we want to reach more people. We also know that people who use only uh, internet through mobile, they don't have the best internet connections. Actually, usually they have lim limited amount of uh, limited data package. So we have to make it light. We have to make it simple. And I think this is one of the ways of tackling. We know it's still uh, 
uh, not enough. And we are now tr uh, discussing, we are, we, are, we are now with the OECD Gov2Gov Incubator Challenge, participating in our, our, our challenge is how to promote more equitable participation. And we want to develop methodologies to reach out for people with limited digital literacy, for example. And so, so and we are, we are partnering with New York, or, uh, New York City Prefecture that uses also this thing and uh, London Greater Authority. And we are discussing like how to, how to blend digital and in-person methodologies. We know that the digital, for example, for a country like Brazil, if you're at the federal level, you have to use digital if you want to reach out. But we know that there are many communities that are not, uh, that will not use that. And we saw that in, in the climate plan, uh, we, the, the meeting that was held in the Amazon region, there were some uh, complaints about using only digital tools. People actually wrote us a letter saying, well, you have to do it in person. You cannot use just digital. Uh, indigenous people in communities are not able to participate. So we, we do face this kind of uh, question in this. I think this is like uh, the, the challenge that we are always looking how to improve our methodology, how to reach out for more people. Uh, I think these are continuous things that we know that we have to improve. And just, just to close up, so we do not have in Brazil um, uh, the tradition of uh, holding climate, uh, climate uh, citizens assemblies in general. This is something that really doesn't exist in Brazil. And now for COP30, we are facing, uh, we ha we, are fa we are going to face a new challenge as there, it has been launched a global, a global climate citizens assembly has been launched at the UN Summit of the Future, and the Brazilian government is endorsing it. So we are now at the, oh, I was at, in Milan uh, yesterday, and we are discussing with the people how, how we are going to do it, and this is something new. So this is uh, how we are going to involve citizens citizens into the COP30, because the, the Climate Action Plan is something for Brazil, although it also is a showcase for what are going to be the Brazilian positions in, at COP30. But how do we promote a global uh, discussion on that? And this, this was something that some civil society organizations have presented, the Global Citizens Assembly, gathering 300 people from all over the world, plus some, some uh, a thousand of community assemblies. It's a very bold project, and, and the Brazilian government has endorsed. So this is our next challenge for for 2025. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Stefan. Uh, it was not enough time, our six sessions, for sure, uh, but it's a matter of balancing time and resources and also people availability and these kind of things. But for sure, we, we needed more time. Um, and regarding the uh, inclusivity, I think the question was about how we are sure having um, a, diverse representation, that uh, was made through the civic lottery process. Um, that means that we send invitations to a sample of the population, already stratified, and then when people, the, if you received an invitation, you could apply for being a participant, but among all the, the applicants, uh, we run this civic lottery, which means that everyone has had the same opportunity to be selected, but we applied this criteria, like we wanted to have like 50% men and women, and the percentages of the low educated, high educated, uh, from the different regions of, of Catalonia, and like that with all the criteria. So within the room, we had this diversity, right? We even uh, set a criteria, attitudinal question about climate change. Do you think it's, uh, climate change is an urgent matter or not? And we were surprised and, and happy because we were able to have some participants who thought that climate change was not an urgent matter. And for us, that was important also to have this profile uh, within the, the room, right? So that, that is the methodology, the process for, for citizen assemblies. Thank, thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I think that this 
uh, to connect with what Neil was saying just before, I think that these three cases show us that at the end of the day, when talking about democracy, technology is uh, the means to an end, but it's not the end itself. And I think putting my OECD hat now, I, I think here we have three very good practices on how actually Decidim is being used not as a uh, as cosmetic tools, but actually is included and embedded in spaces of decision making, whether uh, a citizen assembly, whether uh, a climate plan, or an European uh, level institution. So, uh, so thank you for sharing these stories, and uh, a big round of applause for all the speakers and good coffee thank program. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.